is Bill Doyle and uh, on Vermont H, along with Sophie, who's um, a known stuff for being a student in my class and, and a very fine student. And we became very interested in, in Catherine Patterson's book. And, and uh, why, did, why did this strike take place, Catherine? Well, um, the strike in, in Lawrence in, in, Lawrence in 1912 took place because the conditions were absolutely miserable for the workers. Uh, they had come from many countries speaking many languages because the mill owners thought if they spoke that many languages, they couldn't possibly talk to each other and start a strike, but they were wrong <laughs> because they did start a strike and they did uh, communicate with each other because uh, the conditions were so terrible. And uh, they were uh, working uh, many hours every week and not making enough to, we was really pretty, set uh, starvation wages. And the Massachusetts legislature told them they had to cut down on hours, so what they did was just cut down on what the people were making. And uh, then they couldn't live off what they were making, so they decided they had to strike uh, for better working conditions, better uh, well, I, I tell money. Sophie, one of the reasons I became interested in, in your book and, which you're, and your good way of thinking we appreciate the work that you've done, not only this book, but all the other books that you have published in your tra credit to this. <laughs> well, you're kind, to, thank to you. To Washington, anyone thank who you. lives in Washington County or, or the state of Vermont. But uh, I became interested because my senior thesis at college was the Anthracite Coal Strike of 192. And, uh, and, and some of the things, the themes that ran through the of 1902, which was so intense that it had to be settled by the, the President of the United States, uh, Wilson. Uh, and so uh, I, and some of the things that you write about in your book, about the conditions between the labor and, and, and industry are, are very much today and, and being thought of today. And, and we both thank you so much for the book that you've written. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And I think uh, what they have in common is the, is the greed of the wealthy. You know, you'd think they had plenty, that they could spare some to, to pay their workers proper wages, but no, no, uh, they needed more, 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 and, and their greed was what defeated them. Really. You have some great examples of that in, in your book. One of them is the, um, the discussion of Rosa, the, the lead character, talking to her teacher. Mm -hmm. And her teacher says, oh, well, you know, the boss thinks his workers are good people and he's going to try and support them. And, and she says, well, mama makes $35 a month. and." 25 cents and he charges $30 for the rent. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you're making five bucks to raise four kids. You're living in a single flat with another family and nobody's got bread and, and you describe it so beautifully. It's really touching in this book about, you know, when the children arrive in Barry, the you know, the gentleman who meets them at the train station says, well, where are the children's bags? And the woman says, oh, they have what they have on. And the gentleman from Barry says, oh, oh, wow. <laughs> can't they don't even have the jackets. They have. <laughs> Their shoes aren't going to work here. They don't have socks. Mm -hmm. and, and it was beautiful, too, that in the story there was a, um, Jake or Jack, the, the boy lead, he has worked in the mills as a 14-year-old boy, maybe, mm -hmm. and he's never had a pair of socks, wool socks. Mm -hmm. And so when he comes to Barry, he gets this pair of wool socks. And I think that's very, you know, ex explanatory of a lot of the experience of young American workers these days. And, mm -hmm. and I think this book is totally relevant in that because these old Italians had this incredible wisdom about the heart and the beauty of humanity being stronger than the force of capitalism. And that was, I think, in the end, the only thing that gave them actual strength because they mm -hmm. so obviously had nothing. I mean, did you feel that there was a turning point 
where they realized their desperation was, you know, in vain if they didn't take it seriously? Or uh, well, um, of course, uh, the, <laughs> to give up your children to someone else is care. Somebody you don't know, somebody in a distant city, uh, yeah. shows how desperate they were. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I think they did it uh, because they cared about their children right. and, and the fact that their children were cold and hungry, uh, but Very. also because they knew that if they were that desperate that the newspapers would get involved and they needed the newspapers to see uh, how desperate the situation was because the newspapers uh, could tell the world that, that uh, what was happening in Lawrence. Um, so um, they were they were media savvy. <laughs> it seemed like there was real national recognition of there this. There finally was, yes. And it was because of the the case that that was being experienced across the nation, or was it because Lawrence was really an example mm. of how bad it could get? I think Lawrence was an example of how bad it could get. Ah. And they uh, uh, the turning point for the strike was the. They had already sent children to New York and to Barry, but they were going to send children to Philadelphia. And so the parents brought the children to the train station, and the police and the guards, National Guards, uh, uh, confiscated the kids, yeah, right? Yeah, took the kids away, beat up the parents, and put them in jail. Uh, and that just exploded all over the national press. Sounds like something uh, yeah. we've seen recently in this country. Well, I'm, you know, it, it just sort of breaks your heart that a book like this written about something that happened in right. 1912 could be relevant for today. We, you know, we hope we've gotten better. We yeah. hope we don't treat children this way anymore. Yeah. We hope that we're humane towards those who work for us and on whom our, you know, Life depends. And livelihood, yeah, I mean, our, yes. we all need uh, each other, right? And, you know, you, you see what hap is happening. Well, there, there were other strikes in 1912, and <coughs> one of them was this one that I, that I studied when I was at, at college, this was the, and uh, <coughs> the, the, there was so much violence and national concern that it finally was settled by uh, the President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Um, and and but but for that intervention, uh, no one knows what would have happened. Yeah. Well, and and Taft, who was president at this period, uh, he invited. Um, and this is uh, maybe a question you were going to ask me later, but um, uh, he invited representatives from this among the strikers to come to Washington and testify about ah. the conditions. Mm -hmm. And uh, one young girl whose hair had been. You know, she'd been scalped she was by the machine. Scalped, right? Yeah, uh, was among the young people who went down to testify, and they testified before a congressional committee. And then Mrs. Taft invited them to the White House for tea. Amazing, right? Right. These tattered. In, in about 1960, kids. a reporter began to get interested in the strike and wondered why we hadn't we didn't know more about the strike. And he heard that the, the daughter of the young woman whose hair had been pulled out was still alive, and he was thrilled. So he went to Lawrence to interview her, and she had never heard the story of her mother's injury or of her mother going to Washington. Oh, Now, my I'm a parent. I cannot imagine that if I had been scalped by a machine, and had been taken to Washington to testify before Congress and to have tea at the White House, I cannot imagine that my children would not know that story. Or but heard it a reporter <laughs> told her the story, she said, oh, my mother always wanted me to comb my hair over the ball spot, but she never told me why there was a ball spot on her head. Oh. So, you know, the fact that after the strike, which was the, one of the most successful strikes, if not the most successful strike, they got everything they asked for. It lasted for months, and, right? Yeah. Four started, months? Yeah. Or? It, yes, almost, three, okay. between three and four months. And the dead of winter, of course. Yeah. It was over on the, 
in March. In March. The, towards the end of March. Ugh. So, uh, and it started, what, before Christmas, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, uh, even though it was successful, they got everything they asked for. They should have asked for more, but they got everything they asked for. But the church said, you know, those leaders were communists and anarchists. Marxists. And Marxists and, yeah. and uh, atheists. atheists. <laughs> so, you, you know, you're anti-church if you were for the strike. And the, and the government said, well, no real American would go on strike and disobey the law and not obey the police. And uh, so, therefore, you're anti-American. And they had this big all-American parade and, and to shame the workers who had won the strike. And so the workers didn't talk about the strike. They didn't even tell their children. That's amazing. About their success. So Catherine, earlier in, in the program you talked about Lawrence, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, and they sent children away from Lawrence. Explain the circumstances why a city would ask children to leave. Yeah. Well, the city didn't do it. The, the strikers did it. Uh, one, so that the kids would be warm <laughs> and have food, and which they certainly did uh, when they came to. In fact, after the strike was over, uh, it was said that the parents who met them at the train didn't recognize their own children because they were rosy cheeked. They and looked beautiful. Chubby and beautifully dressed. Thank you, Barry, huh? <laughs> Thank you, Barry. <laughs> they did such a wonderful job. I, I mean, the generosity. I lived in Barry for 28 years. Mm. I, I never lived anywhere. Right, uh, you grew up traveling, right? Half I that mean, long, yes. I, I lived in many, many places. Uh -huh. I, I will always think of Barry as my hometown because Aww. I lived there so long. And I'm so proud of Barry and Barry history. Oh, it's We're gorgeous. All We're all proud of Barry. Yeah. yeah, and I, I just, uh, you know, I, I want all of them. I want the whole world to know the generosity of those Italian stone workers. They didn't have to be good to the, the poor, ignorant Southern Italian <laughs> well, you immigrant wrote. children, but they, you know, they took them into their own homes and treated them as though, though they're their own children. So how many children did, did Barry take? 35. And did any of the 35 stay? No, none of the 35 stood. In my book, <laughs> which is fiction, jo <laughs> Senator Joy, uh, in my book, there's a boy who stays. And I wanted somebody to stay in Barry. I mean, that's as a writer and as a person who loves Barry, I wanted one of those children to be able to live out their lives in Barry. So I had to invent a child that nobody would miss if he didn't go home. Now, those actual 35 children were going back to loving homes. Right. And they would certainly have been missed if they hadn't shown up. <laughs> yeah. So I had to invent somebody who st stole away on the train so nobody knew he was there, who kept himself out of sight of people who were counting heads, and uh, who somehow uh, would remain in Barrie and, and belong to Barry after the strike was over. That was just my privilege as the writer of a work of fiction. So how was the strike finally settled? <laughs> the, the strike was finally settled because the, the uh, owners were brought to the table. And I mean, they, they weren't making any money when those um, mills were closed. How does that line go? <laughs> the sound of silence, right? Yeah. They will understand the, the sound, sound of, of silence. silence. I exactly. love that. When there's no whirring in the mills. Yeah. Uh, uh, and there's no change in their pockets. And there's no change in their pockets, then they will be brought to, and, and I think they thought, you know, it's dead or winter. These people aren't going to last. Yeah. And they did last. And, and partly they lasted uh, because of the generosity of workers from you know, were sending uh, soup, they were sending food. Uh, the, uh, you, I have a, a list of the uh, articles in the Barry newspaper. They're, they're having all these activities at the Socialist Labor Hall to earn money to send to the, the striking The families, in sure. So, uh, you know, there was a cooperation uh, all around New England. Uh, among other workers to help the workers. So what was happening workers. in the mills, in the, in the, at the, the mills where people work, what was, 
the working conditions and so on. I'm sorry? What, what, could you say anything about the working conditions? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> they were pretty awful. I mean, you well, know, there, there was not much safety. They, they weren't worried about the safety of the workers. Workers got killed. Right, you had the example of uh, a fire breaking out fires breaking in the out. Wool, woolen mill. Yes. And the main lead character's father was killed in that yes. fire and left a single mother with four children. Yeah, and there wasn't any uh, compensation. Right, uh, insurance no, policies. No, or no. <laughs> we have done better about compensating people for, for deaths at work or, or mm. injuries at work. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing we've done better at, because in those yeah. days you get killed, your, your husband gets killed in the mill. That's it. That's it. Right. Uh, nobody's going to go well, it was sue for damages. Similar in Barrie, right? A lot of, I mean, the life expectancy was like 40 years old at that time in 1912 or 1918. No, well, you know. and of course the stone workers. Right, they so all got silicosis. Got some. silicosis and but died it, young. Yeah, I loved your tribute too to the carvers. I, you know, enjoy the the stone a lot, and just even the closing line of your book is so beautiful. About, you know, well, I'll read it because it really is. Um, uh, the English. Oh no, that's the historical note. Ah, I should have marked it. And Jake Beale began to run, even though. His new boots sometimes slipped on the icy cobbles. He did not stumble. How strange, how wonderful it seemed to be running not away from petty crime or deadly fear, but toward a new life where bread was never wanting and roses grew on stone, in stone. <laughs> and roses grew in stone. And I thought that was really beautiful because that was, you know, the whole beauty of their message, mm -hmm. of the humanitarian aspect of workers mm -hmm. and their need for bread and their need for warmth and their need for wool socks. And, you know, it's been an issue for the labor movement always to be seen as human yeah. and to have those parts of our, you know, experience really recognized beyond, okay, well, the boss can afford five cars and <laughs> whatever about the rest of us, you know. Yes, yes. So I really appreciated your writing about Barry too, because yeah. I think it was important to recognize that individuals in Barry had taken the opportunity, coming to a new country, learning new skills, participating in a new economy, and actually owning small businesses themselves. Yes. And so this was a major step that a lot of Americans in more um, industrialized areas like Lawrence, I suspect, mm -hmm. didn't understand yes. they had the right to participate in. So that was a beautiful. Yeah, you really mm -hmm. blended things so well in this book. I am thrilled that you <laughs> wrote you, it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, uh, Sophie. Thank you. Who took the lead in settling the strike? Uh, well, the Wobblies, you know, the... The workers. Uh, the yeah, workers. Uh, had come in and helped organize these disparate languages and, and uh, nationalities and religions and everything that the workers represented and helped them uh, plead for what they wanted. Uh, uh, there, were, there, was, there was a local man who, was, who had actually started the strike, but he knew that, that he didn't have the uh, skills to organize it in a way that it would be lasting and it would, would really make, make a difference. And, and he was arrested early on, right? Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, well, I, you know, the uh, three leaders of the strike were uh, arrested. arrested for the death of the woman that had been killed by the National And that was the in the first week, right? Yeah. Something yeah, like that? On. But but they kept sending messages from jail, <laughs> telling people what to do. And 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 one thing is kind of wonderful, is the singing. Ah, uh, well, yes. Uh, the, and of course, this was very much of the women, because many of the workers, of course, were women. Uh, interesting in the pictures of the strike, you don't see so many women. You see the men. Oh, interesting. But, 
but more of the workers were women. So I don't know why, you, you know, maybe men always get the attention, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but anyhow, uh, yeah, they sang. And, and uh, somebody said, I don't know whether it's Helen Gerlachan or who, who it was, said, uh, you can't defeat a movement, a singing movement. Right. And I think about that in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. my, my husband was in jail during the civil rights movement. And, and he said they crowded them all into this big cell and they, there was not room to lie down or even sit up. So they just sang all night. Mm. And he said it ran the jailers crazy. <laughs> Come and beat on the bars and tell them to <laughs> shut up. And they would just sing and sing. And, and you know, it, there is something rather wonderful well, about people who are singing. Uh, was it Estonia that separated from Russia through the singing revolution? Oh, think, really? Yes, there's a movie made about it. It's oh, a documentary. I seen that. Oh. And when Russia started to um, become, you know, different countries uh -huh. again instead of the, U of the USSR, Estonia was, I think, the first country to initiate that with a singing revolution where at their main yearly gathering, there were something like 25,000 people singing the national anthem, a okay. new national anthem together. And the Russians literally started like freaking out and <laughs> leaving the country by foot, you know? <laughs> it was fabulous. So, can you tell, explain who the presidents were at the time? Yeah, well, Taft was the president in, in 1912. And, you know, I remember Taft, even when I forget his name, because I was uh, part of a book on the White House, and he couldn't get out of the bathtub in the White House. They had to, get, because he was too fat. So they had to build a house. new bathtub in the White House that would accommodate his yeah. body. But, uh, but he was, the, I, and he, and, and Mrs. Taft, I think, was very instrumental in, uh, in bringing the, strikers to Washington to tell about the conditions mm. uh, in the mills. So the president, to some degree, played a role in the second Yes, the, he did play a, play a role in it. And I think this is still happening where you have major discrepancies within the union or, you know, corporate entities where uh -huh. you have like a town like Lawrence where maybe people don't know what the laws are and who cares. And then you have towns like Barrie where they know what the laws are. Uh -huh. And they're not going to let you mess with them. <laughs> and that's it, you yeah. know? It's like, these are the laws. No, you abide by them, so do we. <laughs> Period. And um, that was also very well no. described in your book because Barry really didn't see that kind of poverty. No. We've asked you a lot of questions this morning. Are there any questions we should have asked you? Oh, heavens. <laughs> I'm always hoping people will ask me questions because when they say, what question should we have asked you? I think, I don't know. What question should they have asked me? Is there a, another question that I should have been asked? Well, I don't know. Was there, I guess this, here it says, um, what was the outcome of the strike? Yeah, what the, happened after yeah, the that's, strike? Yeah, that's what I was saying, that, that mm. they were made ashamed of what they accomplished. And do you have an example or two, maybe, where yeah, of the, people were? Yeah, the girl who didn't know that her mother Oh, right, that was a perfect mother. example, uh, sure. And uh, uh, they're, they're just, you know, even, even though it was such a wonderful outcome of the strike, I mean, such a, amazing. It sort of dropped out of the history books. I mean, or we don't do a lot with labor history in our history books. No, we really don't. I mean, when I was being taught history, it was there was this war, and then nothing happened. And then, goody, another war. And in like 1970. Happened. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so, um, so what's happening to the ordinary people gets dropped out of the history books, I think. Mm. And it wasn't until the 60s and 70s that people began to think, why don't we know about the Lawrence strike? Because yeah. it was a very important strike in labor history. Huge. And they began nosing around. And, and when I was working, I, I, I started writing about it because I saw the picture of the ch children standing on the steps. Which is a beautiful thought, picture. And, you know, I just, I, know I just, uh, 
But yeah. here's the old one. You know, I had, I had chills going down, up and down my spine. I said, there's a story in that picture. I've got to find out what the story is, because I didn't know this story. And you, so you mentioned people take, not being taken out of it. It, these days. There are some pe prominent people are being dropped from being in history, and uh, that's just some more recent. Uh, so um, it's, it's, it's imperative that the press and all, all the people involved should. Yeah, it's a reason why history should be kept alive. History should. We got to learn from our history, don't we? Uh, and it, and it, you know, it really bothers me that this book is so relevant for today. Yeah, uh, it's stunningly relevant. Yeah, and a lot of it's interesting to me how you've tucked in these little pieces of wisdom that are very. Um, this book was written for young adults, right? Yes. And so it has a lot of wisdom. Like I'm not a parent, but if I were a parent, I want I would want my child to understand that their thoughts are where their life is going to go. Mm -hmm. and that their camaraderie with their family is really the most important thing, even if circumstances are difficult mm -hmm. and your education also is imperative and it will be sought after by many groups who uh, need your assistance as either smart or crafty or capable or whatever the different talents individuals have. And so I, I just really appreciate you putting this beautiful book together for young adults to learn from the history, but also from uh, somebody who's experienced a lot of life's quirks and t curves and, <laughs> and been able to describe them, you know, in a very helpful well, way. Well, I loved right. I'll well, follow up with but. what Sylvia's just, Sylvia's just said, and there's some, uh, some, some, some things that we've talked about that, should, that we should have brought up in this interview. I don't know. One thing I did think about while Sophie was talking was that uh, uh, two, two years ago, I think it was, I was chair of the uh, National Book Award jury for young people's literature, mm. and the winner was Senator, uh, I mean, uh, Congressman, uh, who went through the civil rights oh. movement, and he got up there with his uh, acceptance, and he said, uh, he said, do you know what it means to me uh, to win this award? Um, I was a sharecropper's son, and I went to the local library, and they said, it's for whites only. Mm. You can't come into the library. Mm. But my teacher told me that books were important, mm -hmm. and so I read everything I, I could. Right. And, and here's a man who's changed the the, uh, the face of the demographic of writing. Of, yeah, of change, well, he's changed the course of, of uh, our country in many ways. Well, something but I should thank you for writing such a beautiful book. Oh, well, thank you for appreciating my book. I really, really am honored, because you're a historian. <laughs> I, I, I like to think that historians would approve of my fiction. Yes, we like it. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Oh, well, thank you so much. Sophie. Thanks so thank much for coming. Thanks so much, Catherine. Oh, thank you. Well, I want to see. <laughs> <laughs>